Uh, hello, my name is Isis Lancovera and my partner Michael Wine. We are both fellows with the International Food Policy Research Institute, also known as IFPRI, and we wanted to share with you today our experience with adapting, monitoring, and relation activities for social distancing and the importance of having phone surveys in your ME toolkit. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so I can get started here. Um, yeah, so during my uh, WeWin fellowship, I was based with IFPRI in Myanmar to support the development and implementation of a national household survey. And the survey particularly focused on uh, agricultural production, rural livelihoods, and nutrition. Um, so up front, the availability of reliable data in Myanmar is uh, pretty limited. And of course, reliable data is necessary for the effective design and monitoring of programs and policies. So our proposed work was to improve policymaking, particularly in the agricultural sector, through collecting data and collaborating with Myanmar researchers. Um, initially, our data collection was conducted face-to-face, -face, which meant that we would travel to various rural communities to survey farmers and small business owners. However, this only lasted for uh, a few months. Um, next slide, please. So early on, uh, Myanmar was uh, quote unquote buffered from the global pandemic, which swept across Asia. And I put um, buffered in quotes as though there were supposedly very few cases in the country early on. Uh, this may have been largely due to uh, limited testing capabilities. Um, but similar to other places around the world, uh, the Myanmar government eventually implemented a series of lockdowns, which included uh, travel restrictions and limitations on gatherings. And the restrictions made it difficult to travel uh, to the countryside and um, as limitations on gatherings prevented us from training researchers to collect data. Um, for these reasons, our face-to-face -face surveys were not really uh, feasible any longer. Uh, however, it remains incredibly important to continue primary data collection to guide effective policymaking for the communities most impacted by the pandemic. Uh, thus, we pivoted to conducting phone surveys. And these were uh, surveys such as those conducted with, um, so with mothers on food security, uh, with food vendors throughout the country, and with various stakeholders in the agri-food system. And this allowed us to compare month-by-month uh, -month scenarios and determine how the pandemic and its associated policies were impacting the Myanmar population. Um, so if you're asking, like, so what came out of these surveys? What happened with them? Um, and from these surveys, our research showed that uh, how Myanmar's lockdown periods had resulted in huge negative impacts on poverty throughout the country. And through those uh, results, we've encouraged the government to expand its social protections and uh, cash, tra cash transfer programs, as well as provided data and policy recommendations to ensure that the agri-food system continued to function smoothly. However, um, as many may know, uh, in February of this year, uh, the military uh, forcefully took over from the democratically led government um, and what has led to several months of large scale political unrest, violence and uh, economic disruption in addition to the pan pandemic. And without government support and as well as reliability, reliable electricity and telecommunications for several weeks, um, we've also had to pivot our research once again to best support um, our development partners and other NGOs to respond to the new crisis. Um, of course, this means that we've also experienced some additional ongoing challenges with our data collection, um, such as respondents being afraid to answer uh, sensitive questions due to political risk, um, extensive migration of survey respondents from um, the large cities to the rural areas, and um, a, like ongoing and inconsistent uh, phone services. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so these are just a few photos um, from, I guess, my time there. On the top left, you'll see um, some of my coworkers interviewing um, farmers. Um, on the bottom left, um, being able to train young Myanmar researchers um, in uh, data collection, uh, economics. And um, on the right side, you'll see, I guess, what the farm, like what the rice paddies in Myanmar look like, as well as um, additional coworkers pivoting to um, so like work from home slash phone surveys while having to handle other uh, family responsibilities. Um, so yeah, I'll pass it on over to Isis on the next slide. Thanks, Michael. 
Uh, so for my first year in the fellowship, I was based in Anand, India. And IFPRI has been a longtime partner with the Foundation for Ecological Security, an Indian NGO. And so my job as an IFPRI fellow was to provide technical support as the foundation prepared to launch an organization-wide study exploring what impacts the foundation has had in the rural communities in which they operate. I was part of the team that was responsible for the development and implementation of household surveys, key informant interviews, and focus group discussions. Like Michael said, collecting data is an important part and an important job for organization. And so the study team wanted to collect intermediate and longer term data on socioeconomic, environmental, and institutional outcomes. This information would be used to strengthen current and future activities. Our work began with the collection of basic information of the communities, including village rosters with names and numbers. This information would be used to call up participants to schedule in-person household surveys, as well as schedule group interviews. Next slide, please. At roughly the same time we were preparing to launch the household surveys, India announced its first COVID-19 lockdown. And it soon became obvious that hitting pause on the study until things went back to normal would not be a possibility. Much like Michael's experience, the pandemic made it impossible for our staff to go to communities and conduct surveys both in person and in village meetings. So turning to mobile surveys made sense and data collection instruments were, that we had already created were yet again adjusted to better suit this new method. Fortunately, most of the basic village information had already been collected by local staff. So meetings were changed from in-person meetings to online meetings were never possible. Pivoting to using phone surveys allowed our work to continue, but there are limitations to conducting phone surveys in MNE activities. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, as EC says, there are a couple of uh, weaknesses of phone surveys, which we wanted to highlight here, um, being those being engagement, uh, data quality, and technology. Um, so on the engagement side, um, building trust and rapport between the survey implementers and the respondents uh, can be challenging. Um, whereas sort of in face-to-face -face interviews, it's sort of much more clear as, as to where the survey implementer is coming from, we're able to provide um, additional information like physical, like say like business cards or um, just being able to sort of validate um, that the information that the respondents are giving will be used in their benefit. Um, and so doing that over the phone um, does pose uh, challenges. Um, yeah, and on the other hand, um, as well as uh, respondent fatigue, um, yeah, having sort of large scale or like long surveys, uh, it does have its sort of challenges uh, over the phone um, with respondents not sort of like sort of dropping off after a while um, with long phone calls. Uh, on the data quality side, there's a potential loss of rich data collected in, um, that is usually collected in face-to-face -face interviews. Um, and such things as social cues, uh, body language, as well as being able to observe the environment of the survey respondent. Um, some of those things that are like, of course, uh, not possible to do through a phone survey. And so there's potential loss of data um, in, those, um, in that process. Uh, at the same time, we're very de dependent on the ability of uh, survey implementers to uh, collect the data as there's um, sort of minimal supervision and sort of being dependent on uh, implementers understanding the technical features of the research. Um, of course, this is also a challenge in face-to-face -face surveys, uh, but continues to, to be, be a challenge in phone surveys as well. And over on the technology side, um, though mobile phone access and digital technology is growing rapidly, uh, access may still be a challenge for um, survey implementers and respondents. Um, and I'll let ECs take over on this topic in particular. It is important to note it, uh, to mention context. For example, in rural India, phones work differently than what we're used to in the United States. You, in India, you purchase minutes um, for your phone and if you want certain amounts of data. So if you're asking someone to stay on the phone with you for an extended amount of time, you're effectively using up their phone minutes. In poor households, this was very pronounced, um, especially those severely impacted with COVID-19, because phones were considered non-essential, especially when compared to food or water. So a lot of phones were not available um, or households had just switched them off, um, which brought up questions of incentives and bias 
which were important to address for the study, um, particularly as we are preparing to launch the fund surveys. Next slide, please. Um, it's not showing up, oh, perfect, okay. Uh, I do want to say that fund surveys have clear advantages uh, being able to leverage existing partnerships is important in the continuation of data collection activities. As I mentioned before, we had already worked with local staff that we had trained to collect the basic village information. And so this local staff were already familiar with the study, the community, but most importantly, the community were familiar with the local staff. And so this was helpful when creating a report with survey participants and getting in-depth answers. Um, there is also the expanding mobile phone coverage and growing share of households that have devices. So there is an ample audience for collecting data and allowing the randomization of participants, which ideally reduces bias. And I will mention that phone service can also be more efficient by lowering costs and reducing travel expenses. Instead of having to go door to door to collect, conduct a survey or having to gather the villagers and wait for everyone to get together to have these village meetings, a phone call is faster. So researchers are able to conduct surveys relatively more quickly, which allows for the regular monitoring of situations without the need to travel to survey locations. Also by leaning on local staff, interstate travel was reduced, which is particularly important during a pandemic. Right, Michael? Yeah, definitely. Um, and building off what the ECs just mentioned about um, the safety and sort of flexibility of these surveys, uh, phone surveys are definitely um, really great for situations um, such as uh, the pandemic and or uh, working in periods of conflict. Um, Especially because yeah, the survey implementers um, don't really don't have to put themselves at risk to say travel cross borders or sort of be in uh, situations that they could expose themselves to um, expose, expose themselves to infection, and so being able to almost like sidestep those movement restrictions um, and to co continue data collection has been really useful in um, staying up to date and um, really understanding how things are in. Um, sort of like on the ground, quote unquote, on the ground situation. Um, and with that, sort of, we're going to the next slide now. Thank you. Um, is this, I think that's uh, yeah. for you. There are guidelines and standards when con conducting monitor violation activities. So while the preferred method of collecting quality, rich, deep data continues to be face to face, yeah, um, there definitely um, are considerations to uh, continue to be, um, that must be taken into account when um, implementing the phone interviews. Um, you can sort of take in, or sort of understand these phone surveys as like quick snapshots of the experiences that uh, women and men face as the result of shocks such as COVID or the military coup. But um, at the same time, it's hard to really understand um, like certain deeper questions, uh, especially specifically around like sensitive questions um, and understand the environment of the respondent and how that may uh, bias or affect their uh, responses. And uh, with that, we thank you for listening to our presentation. Uh, and we have our contact info here uh, if you want to contact us for any additional questions. We have a couple of questions in the chat. First one is, how did you obtain the phone numbers from people and did this approach introduce a bias in your survey? For example, who owns the phone? Hi, I'm happy to take that one. Uh, before we conduct a study, we go to a village to obtain permission from the elders and the community themselves to conduct a study. So when we do that, we also ask permission to collect a village roster. And we explain that we do this in order to make sure that we can have everyone's input and information um, for the study. And during this approach, we collect all this information and we also make sure very clear um, that if, uh, this personally identifiable information will be kept secure. And it's actually a, a big requirement of any research that you conduct um, to keep that information secure. And it, we 
it does reduce bias, but we do try to mitigate that by randomizing. Um, However, we did try to mention that, that we are very sensitive as to who owns the phone and more importantly, who has the, um, the minutes and things of that nature, um, which is why, why we also were thinking of incentives because you can ask people like, hi, we're gonna ask you a survey and we will pay for the minutes that it takes to have this conversation. Yeah, um, at the same time, um, like as you say, it, it's, these surveys are, I guess, meant to be, um, like completely representative, uh, like especially being able to draw um, sort of like complete conclusions from the data gathered is sort of just as like snapshots or previews of to from which we can draw inferences um, at, to, to the best of our ability during sort of like unique circumstances. Yeah. This goes into the next question in the chat. Uh, did you come into any challenges with location with no phone service? Sorry, uh, with no phone network access. If so, how did you manage to navigate this? Yeah, I guess I could take that one. Um, so initially, probably in the first few months uh, following the military coup in Myanmar, um, there were pretty like long periods of unstable phone network um, connection. And yes, of course, this poses many challenges implementing phone interviews, um, and in essence, pretty much we just continue to try to follow up with people on a month by month basis. Um, sometimes that results in like, you know, there's some people from our uh, survey sample or our survey um, respondent group uh, who are unable to answer the questions at those times. But um, that's just the part that we have to sort of take into account and within our um, findings uh, in the research. And in our case, um, because we had already done this previous work collecting the basic information, we sort of had a better understanding of which villages uh, didn't have ne uh, phone networks. And this is where leaning on our local enumerators who were already part of that community came in handy because even though we might not be able to collect data from that particular village at the moment, we would just like mark it and then hope that in the future we would be able to have enumerators go there. Um, and as Michael said, it's snapshots, but it's also a way for data to continue to be collected, particularly in a pandemic where all travel was restricted. It was sort of like a, some data is better than no data. And do you see benefits of blending in person and phone serving? And what would be the advantages? I guess I can take that one, Steve. Yes, uh, as we mentioned in our previous slide, we definitely believe that it should be part of your toolkit, um, but it will definitely not replace sort of these more in-person interviews um, that just provide the data. And so blending, I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah, um, and to resp respond to Dan's question, um, there, we, have had, we have an example actually uh, in our Myanmar surveys where prior to uh, COVID, we had an in-person survey um, of say of rural households in a certain area. Um, but yeah, once COVID sort of occurred or once COVID sort of became like a huge, large uh, issue with, especially within Myanmar, um, we were able to continue that like subsequent panels of that survey uh, using phone interviews. Yeah. Great, so this is the last question before we go on break. Uh, from Micah, I faced extreme Resistance when suggesting phone surveys, both before and during the pandemic, which was surprising given how common phone surveys are used in the U.S. policy research. Uh, did you find a lot of researchers in the international health slash nutrition had a bias against this kind of survey and what changed their mind? I can start off um, because we definitely experienced a lot of pushback in our organization when we first mentioned phone surveys. Uh, we had spent a lot of time and effort creating all of this data collection instruments. And so um, for the longest time, the higher ups were saying like, let's just wait and conduct in-person interviews. Um, what changed our minds was honestly the pandemic, just because there was no other option. Like if we had waited even longer, then the study would have been prolonged, prolonged and then there was funding issues. Um, but now that it has been done, 
And I would definitely emphasize that like, it's part of a toolkit. We will um, go back whatever pos where, wherever possible and collect more information or even use it as like, um, hey, we're conducting this fun surveys and getting the snapshots and then we can really delve deeper into some of the things that we find. Um, so <laughs> changing minds, very difficult, but just mention it's a part of your toolkit, you know, like it's not the whole thing.